Welcome to Improving Debate's Impact. IDI is a lecture series by IDEA which looks at the many ways in which we make debate education happen. So we like to ask the question, how can we make debate work better? Because behind every talented debater, there is a team of coaches and administrators that enable the trainings, travel and tournaments to take place. We are employees at IDEA. My name is Dan Welling. I'm the head of office in Utrecht. Uh, before joining IDEA, I debated as a hobby. Um, I won the European University's debating championships in 2012 in the English second language category and reached the ESL final of the world championships in 2013. That's the last time that for this series, I'm gonna mention these things. But I am most proud of how I have been able to use debate to connect personal stories to current political issues. In my best ever final speech, I personally got to talk about how hard it was to enter university as a first generation university student. And with my work at IDEA, it has led me to support young people talking about the importance of being aware of your roots and fighting against xenophobic rhetoric in the Netherlands and supporting the formation of an action plan for financial inclusion for young people. I'm joined here with Moimir. Moimir, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, my name is Moimir and alongside working for the Slovak Debating Association, I work as a project manager for IDEA. I've actually been debating since I was 14 and the IDEA Youth Forum about 10 years ago was, I think, my first international experience and the first, uh, well, the first, definitely the first international debate tournament that I've ever been to. So I debated intensively throughout the high school, probably also thanks to this experience. And, but I've only dabbled in college debate on the US circuit, so I have no impressive achievements <laughs> like the EUDC, no, no names to drop here. Um, but I think what I most appreciate about debate is that I think, and also definitely from my experience, it seems to be the case, that it helps people become better thinkers and teaches them to evaluate ideas on their merits rather than just um, author like their author the appeal from authorities or their social context of what is like popular, what are the cool ideas to have. Um, yeah, so I will be doing this podcasting series, this video series with them. Great, wonderful. Well, we're going to kick it off with this show and we're going to talk about two things, essentially. Um, we're going to first look at a framework for how we can think about organizing effective debate events and helping you get on the way. And then also we're going to look at some listeners' questions. Uh, we've got a few from social media before the event kicked off, uh, but also if you want to add your own questions, please write them into the YouTube live chat uh, and we will look at them at the end of our first section just to get an overview of what you were thinking uh, and hope to answer that. Obviously, the learning doesn't stop there. Uh, we have provided a series of links in the show notes, uh, both on YouTube and later on when this, we will publish this as a podcast, where you can find all kinds of useful guides, both uh, project management books, but also a couple of books by the iDebate Press, uh, one on how to organize a debate tournament, on how to set up a debate club, and how to set up your own training schedule. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, sounds great. So maybe opening the topic of this part, which is about project management. Um, yeah, so let's talk about what are usually the things that can go wrong when organizing an event from your experience, Dan. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was part of a team that organized the World University Debating Championships in the Netherlands. Um, and that wasn't really done through a professional event organization company. Um, because like with many events that are run in the debate world, all of us were students or we were recent graduates. Uh, so it was an idea that was planned months in advance when we wanted to bid. Obviously, we spent about a year and a half actually organizing it. Um, rather, there was no one who had been to host the World Championships that year. So the idea to bring Worlds to The Hague was brainstormed over during dinner in Malaysia. Uh, and then a lot of effort that was brought into making Worlds work that was trading on the job. That's not to say that Dutch World didn't run very well. It did run really well, I think. Um, and it was one of the first worlds that managed to run aggressively on schedule. That was an effort that was guest helped by the experience and the informal networks of many of the people who came before us. We spoke to past conveners. We had the luck that we got the guys who wrote the Tabby 2 software, which was revolutionary at the time, on board. And some of the things that went wrong were things that we couldn't necessarily have prepared for. It's so like the day before, the event would start, we found out that all the badges with the barcodes were printed wrongly. And that meant that we had to find a new printing shop 
on a day at Christmas where almost all printing shops in the Netherlands were closed. So rather than organize the event, the convener just drove around the Netherlands trying to find the one print shop that according to Google Maps was open to try and get a last minute printing job to happen. And then in the evening, the entire Orcom was plucked out of the opening ceremony, sitting in a formal wear and trying to get everyone's badges sorted out. But I feel like a lot of these stresses would have been less stressful if we had known a little bit more about being prepared in advance. Uh, because there are a lot of things you can prepare for and see in advance. And one thing I learned when I transitioned into doing debating and or debate organizing for a living rather than as a hobby was to really consider things from a more management perspective. So that's what I'd, I'd like to talk about today, something called project cycle management. We're going to look at what it is, how you can use it, and then of course we also give you the links um, in the show notes that you can use to, to use this tool for yourself. Yeah, so you mentioned, you also mentioned that there, and I know there are, there are so many like philosophies and different guidebooks and different ways of doing project management. You know, you can probably just go on Coursera and find seven different ways and philosophies that different people advocate. So why these, why this project cycle management? Why this PCM? Why should someone care about this one in particular? Yeah, that's a very fair question. I think it's obvious first benefit is that I found it quite easy to use and implement. I think lots of management does do that in a certain way. The philosophies are sound very buzzy or cat body. And when you read it, you're thinking, ah, that's obvious. But you do want to read it, so you have a bit of an overview. Uh, the second benefit, however, is that PCM is something that has been developed and promoted by the European Commission and EU8. And that's important because a lot of debating organizations, certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, but also when you move outside of Europe in the developing world, often receives donor funding from governments and from other non-governmental organizations. They really care about using tools like this. And therefore, if you know how to use a tool like this, it is both more likely that you're going to be able to work well with the donors, as well as make sure that you follow their demands and actually secure funding. But the third benefit, I think, is that it helps you set a very good sort of starting point for a project or a series of projects. And I think that's most important because projects in debate usually start out immediately like getting into implementation. And then you deal with problems the way you see it. This can, I think, lead to a lot of stress and difficulty for the volunteer teams. And being well prepared allows you to see the roadblocks coming from miles away and help you avoid getting thrust in the mud. So sure, you can use it as simple or as complex as possible. And I think that elements of PCM can sound a bit complex. There's quite a bit of terminology to wade through. But if you just follow the simple steps that we outline and that are outlined in the list, I think you have enough to get started. Great, yeah, so now that we know what it is, what does this PCM actually look like? Okay, let's get started on that one. So this will be a while, but I hope we'll get it clear as much as possible. It's consisting of five steps. It is a programming of identification, formulation, implementation, and evaluation. And like with many models, people add things, some have six, some have four, but I like to go with this. So it's a bit of a pithy if you want to have a abbreviation that unfortunately isn't too catchy. So let's look into that. And then just to make it a little bit more concrete, um, what I want to do is I just want to draw back and think about organizing an international debate competition for high school students um, and use that as an example throughout explaining it so it gets a little bit more bite. Let's then first start with programming. Now, putting it in somewhat flowery terms, programming is the fertile soil upon which your project rests. So with programming, you decide the overarching mission and goals of your organization or project. It's a bit like a mission statement. So this can vary from organization to organization. Some debate clubs, they're set up because they believe debate is a value of academic tool, because it teaches you to argue and productively disagree. Other organizations, they feel its primary value is to build citizenship components and provide direct action opportunities for its participants. And a third line of thinking is that it helps with language acquisition. And running through all these themes probably should be that debate is also quite simply quite fun. It's nonetheless important to take a moment to reflect on your mission and vision because choices that you will make with your events may differ based on having a different mission. If you want to run an event that is simply fun, just maximize the number of rounds and invest in a great social. But don't necessarily spend extra time on feedback or workshop in advance of the rounds. If you want it to be a learning event, for instance, because it's a prep competition for the world's championships, you may want to extend the feedback time or budget a little bit more money to get some excellent adjudicators in. 
And that, let's just jump to the next theme, which is identification. So we've looked at the big overarching themes, but with identification, you look at the stakeholders. You look at who is going to attend your event. Who do you want to attract? What needs do they have? So the language of the EU often consider these as to be like problems that you want to solve. So they say like these stakeholders, they have problems that you need to address. For instance, high school students may have a problem that the formal education system uh, doesn't provide a lot of critical thinking. And you might be resistant in thinking of our kids as having problems per se. Or if you think at it from like a perspective of a debater, you say, well, they're not being very good at international relation motions. That's not necessarily a problem, or maybe it's a first world problem. But I think you may want to like look at it from a more bird's eye view and think that that actually might be something that's a stumbling block and helping kids overcome that is helpful on the long run. Of course, sometimes you may not know what the desires are of your target group. I'll admit, uh, being only 28, that I no longer fully understand what 16 year olds really like all the time. Uh, or at the very least, I've tried TikTok and it doesn't really suit me. So, in that sense, you might be wondering, what do they want? And I think that asking them, uh, and this is like in the common parlance, a feasibility study, might be very useful to do. And that doesn't have to be very hard. Like you could run out a large questionnaire and hope there is some uptake, but it could also be as simple as a series of polls on Instagram or Facebook. For instance, the debate club at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, they wanted to know whether people wanted more rounds with five minutes or fewer rounds with seven minute speeches. And the majority of the poll respondents says more rounds. So that's what they ended up with. And therefore they catered towards their needs and catered towards, I, I guess, the feedback desire that these people had when they could do more rounds. Another good reason to do that is because it helps create some ownership by the community over the project. Your target group then feels that they take desires into consideration and they're more likely to want to, to actively participate. Oh, they might even get started to get excited to go to your tournament. And it makes, therefore, potentially reach your tournament to a larger audience. Let's move then to formulation. So if you know the mission and the needs of your likely target audience, you can use those building blocks to form a project proposal. And we call that formulation. It's then important to look at a couple of components. What activities are you going to run them in? In the which time frame? And what are your resources or finances? So what are you going to do? When are you going to do it? How are you going to pay for it? You run through this formulation to see whether your project is feasible or not. So in EU speak, often the formulation is neat because afterwards you get financing. So you send a uh, application to a donor and then they decide whether to fund you or not. But it might be that you don't need donor money, rather you can rely on batch fees. And then your formulation is looking at, so okay, how many teams do we need to get in to make this thing viable? Let's look at the tournament that we are considering building. So say that we've concluded that this tournament should be a learning experience for novice debaters. And also we find it important that novice debaters get to know each other and the broader debate community so that they're motivated to stay in the game. Activities can then be designed to follow these two goals. Let's think about some of these activities. So one of them obviously is debate rounds. And I guess it's also important to have some kind of social event. But let's think a little bit more deeply about the target audience. It's likely they're a bit younger, right? They might be between 14 and 16. So it means, for instance, it's less likely parents would allow them to be away for too long. That means that your time frame of activities becomes limited. Say only one full Saturday, and we can squeeze in an arrival on Friday evening. Now, that means you don't have time for a good Saturday evening farewell party if you're planning on that, uh, because the kids need to get home. You might therefore want to focus some social activities on a Friday evening. So the kids don't know each other that well yet. They haven't done debating yet. They're all very new. They're going to be pushed out of the bus. Um, so I think it's important then to run some icebreaker games where they get to meet new people. They might also want to learn something already. Um, so we don't have time for both like a workshop and an icebreaker usually on the Friday evening. So how can we combine the social with the learning? Um, one of the popular things to do is to have a quiz, maybe about some current events. And then what you can also do is have some icebreakers that are designed to organize teams for this pub quiz, um, or rather like non-alcoholic pub quiz, of course, uh, that are organized, uh, they're used to organize teams across school lines. Uh, so they get to meet, meet new people immediately. Let's then look for instance at the base that we're gonna run on Saturday. So basically, I think you could run about four debates on one day. That means three debates and then maybe a final. 
But just having a public final fit with our goals, does it learn you more things than if you do an extra round yourself? Maybe not. So you could, of course, go with a final, but you could also choose to have an extra round for everyone. And then in the award ceremony, you make the winners, those who top the tap after four rounds. Are there ways to think about feeling embedded into the wider community than during novice rounds? Because often these are lots of like 40 year olds running around, but where are the older kids? Now, I came across a very cool example in another circuit. In Australia, they have a novice tournament on the university circuit that they call Easters. And at that tournament, teams consisting of novice speakers with one older speaker participate. This older speaker helps get the kids introduced to the wider circuit, to their own friend and community. And also they can be a very helpful and competing voice during preparation. So maybe we can do this with our novice team as well. Have one of the older kids be a coach. And in this formulation phase, you've seen that we thought through our event and we look carefully at the needs of our target groups and our themes. And we've come out with a tournament that already differs on three elements from a standard novice competition. And we've also looked at some practical constraints that influence the choices we get to make. And I think this generally can help the tournament look out, come out looking better. Now, how do we put this into one document for easy overview? The PCM structure thought about this and it follows something called a logical framework matrix. And if you check the research list for like a sheet and an entire website, it helps you build such a logical framework. They can use that to fill this in for your own project. I could run through it entirely, but it's a bit verbose in its vernacular. In other words, there's a lot of difficult words that you need to understand to follow a true logic. If you go through that website, you will find out how to run through it. So after you do that, you have the big moment. That's the decision point. Can we go through with our event? I find that that largely depends first on the question of finances and secondly on some other resources you need to have. So by this stage, you have, of course, thought long and hard about your proposal. If you need external financiers, you can actually use this material that you've come up with to write your financing proposal. But if you have participants and registration fees, and that's enough, you should probably want to calculate how many people should at minimum attend your events. Regardless of how you go about this, this is probably the moment where the traffic light turns to red, so cancel project, back to the drawing board, orange, proceed, but with caution, or green, good to go, settle sales for your project. And if you look at other resources, you might want to think about who's going to be on your team, are there enough people to do all the tasks that are important, and I think very important, um, who's going to be your external team, right? So not within your own club, but for instance, who are your chief adjudicators? Um, does your national debate organization, do they provide some help? And then, of course, you move towards implementation. So that's a phase that may be most familiar to you if you've already organized an event. And I think what's important here is you think about who does which action and what time. Who does which action at what time? Think about the team you have available. What are their skills? What do they want to do and learn? And then think about your activities and think about them from a stakeholder perspective once more. So when do the participants need to know what about your event? And finally, think about the deadlines for your project from a feasibility perspective. So when would you need to secure a venue? What information do you need before you can close that deal? And this can, for instance, be related to the fact that some venues get more expensive as time go by. Like a hostel usually jacks up the rates a few weeks in advance. So you might want to secure that one really ahead of time, but it's often a little bit easier to find a caterer slightly closer to the date. So based on this brainstorm session, you can then build an action plan that takes all these things into consideration. For instance, for this tournament of ours, an enormous amount of choices are going to consist on knowing ahead of time that you have participants and how many. At the same time, there's a bit of a catch-22 because participants will only usually show up if you have a product and offer that they want to participate in. Thinking about them, what is most important is that you have a program and that you communicate that program well. At the same time, if you have to wait until registrations roll in, you might be close to the date and it's going to be a lot more expensive to secure that hostel for Friday night. So you might want to look at a similar event to yours and pre-book some rooms based on your expecting amount of participants. If a tournament was organized last year, it's likely you're going to get a similar amount of people coming in this year, unless of course a global pandemic completely destroys your registration. Check until when you can cancel without having to pay any fees so you know that that is the deadline for which teams need to register and plan other deadlines accordingly. And one final check on this is that you might want to brainstorm for things that may go wrong. Now some things can aren't planable. Every project manager in this world had no plans for a global pandemic, as you might have seen from your email inbox back in March, which basically meant that everything got canceled. 
but there are things that might be a bit more foreseeable. A kid could get homesick. It could get food poisoning. A fire alarm can go off into the building. You're running the event in the winter, and by round one, you find out that half the participants are stuck in a snowstorm. So about two months in advance, I recommend to have a session where you think about all these likely problem spots and plan for contingencies. This is often called a pre-mortem. So rather than post-mortem, something has died, let's find out how it died. Think about, oh, something is going to die, how will it? And you may never need to bring any of these into action. Um, we had a particularly grim discussion for Worlds where we talked about various scenarios and what we needed to do when someone from the organization team would, ha would be hospitalized um, or would die. And fortunately, we all survived. But we did have a moment at the final day where our convener got hospitalized with an infection. Um, and it was really helpful to know in advance that the chain of command would be restructured in a way that the final day could go up without a hitch. You find in general that if something does go wrong, you're going to find is there for the most valuable moment of your planning process. Think of them as health insurance. I didn't spend a single minute of my life last year going to the doctors. If tomorrow I break my leg, I think I'll be incredibly happy I dutifully paid my insurance on time. Let's finally then turn to evaluation. So sure, it can be tiring to run an event. There are tons of things that can happen. And at any point in time, you think things may go wrong. So it's okay to take a breather shortly after the end. But then I think you do want to evaluate the event and find out whether what you did worked. <laughs> Why? Well, you may want to run this event again or a different event again, or this event was one of a series of events that your organization ran. And through evaluation, you might find out about new needs or strategic priorities. Maybe the kids really didn't value the learning aspect that much. They just felt that the social component was more important. So think back about where you were when you started the event. You may have had no idea where to start. That's because you might have been the first one to organize it. Or you couldn't build on the experience of prior events as they didn't run an evaluation, they just disappeared in the mist. Think of running an evaluation as at the very least paying forward to the next set of conveners. You can of course evaluate your team and or you can evaluate with the stakeholders, with the people who attended your event. You probably wanna be a little bit more specific in this evaluation than just asking all the novice debaters whether they had a good time. So when you plan an event, think back about your theme and activity specific priorities. So we wanted in our example, create a great learning environment and we wanted them to feel welcome to the debate community. And probably evaluation questions that you ask should reflect these goals. And evaluation also helps bring the cycle in project cycle management. It feeds back into the next project. You may have found that the kids didn't really like the quiz on Friday evening. You may find out they loved it to debate with an elder. Or they were different, but that the elder felt super engaged and now wants to become a debate trainer. And that they're asking for works on how to get better at being a trainer. And that can then kick off an entire new project for your community based on needs that you hadn't identified before. Okay, let's conclude. Um, so the example we used here was to help run a efficient project. Um, and I think that an example of a debate tournament is quite optimal, right? Clearly defined structure and purpose, but narrow in scope. I do think that this approach truly comes to shine if you have to do some more complex programming. It allows your program namely to have to make a consistency to create a building block where each event builds on the other. So you can start managing more complex projects without losing track of things. Think for instance, when you run your debate club at the beginning of the year, you start with some novice sessions, you maybe run a tournament as well, you wanna run a public lecture. So there's all these kind of events that a debate board needs to keep in mind. And then there might be some overarching themes of things you think this year is going to be incredibly important to focus on. Having that meeting at the beginning of the year can influence all the different kinds of sessions you're running throughout the year. Does this feel daunting at this stage? I think it might be, because I've been talking for nearly 20 minutes and it sounds like it might be a lot of work. For me though, the scariest bit is when I stare into a project abyss and all I can see is darkness, when I don't know where to start or when to start. That's paralyzing to me. What project cycle management does for making sure that I have these meetings and think about my goals is provide a ladder you can use to climb into the project. It gives you some grip. It lets you know what you need to do. So that's briefly, I hope, how you can think about organizing a project from much more of a management perspective. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. That, that, that was very useful. Um, and I guess I, I'll just have a few follow-up questions about the framework and your thinking on it. So overall, I guess it just sounds very useful. It sounds like obvious things that to me, <laughs> 
seems like people should be doing when organizing events. And I just wonder, like, in your experience, how do you usually do you usually use it? Do you usually, like, when you organize an event, do you try to fo- follow the logical framework matrix explicitly, or is it just something that you've kind of by now internalized, or did you just learn from experience and you know, only learned project management later, and then you're like, oh, wow, I wish I knew this before. I wouldn't have made all those silly mistakes. I think I really learned this kind of thing on the job. Um, and it's really been so helpful because it's, um, because I did make a lot of the mistakes that I outlined as well uh, in this lecture. Um, so that, so it was really helpful to get a, get a bit of training into it. Uh, and I would recommend that if you can find either a free workshop or like there's, as you mentioned previously, there are Coursera things on this, um, to spend a bit of time into that, uh, but also just to familiar yourself a little bit with these kind of things, I, I think is really, really helpful um, because it does improve later. And like not all of us go to uni or go to college uh, and, and study project management um, and end up at project management fields later on in life. And then I think you'd be very, very helped by um, like explicitly running it into by now i still look at these kind of like crutches to help me get started uh because it's honestly you can like get lost in lots of the details um so it's very useful to uh, think about them in advance and, and and get these things together so you can more meaningfully structure it um obviously from some of the smaller things if you've done them a couple of times you are able to think about them without too much thought like I've run in my student days the uh, debating tournaments at Leiden four or five times. And I think that without a guide, I could probably still run an event in Leiden. Uh, I just need to check whether my, my caterers are still in business or not, because uh, I haven't been into the city for about four years now. Uh, but in general, uh, I, I think it's, it's always going to be helpful to explicitly have this crutch next to you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds useful. De- definitely the barcoding fiasco sounds like something that could have been avoided <laughs> had you done a pre-mortem. Um, great. So I guess maybe the opposite question is, do you think there can be such a thing as like too much project management thing? And is it something that you've experienced? Like um, may- maybe it just seems like it would be more convenient to actually just jump into implementation, but um I don't know, someone who has been to business school just really wants to like go through all the possible uh, like brainstorming schemes and uh, um, fra- frameworks that, you know, they spend a lot of time learning. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? No, you're, you're, you're very fair. And I, I think having gone to business school, you might have heard about something called minimum viable products. Um, yeah. And I th- like, it's, 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 it's very analogous to like, when have you analyzed an argument enough, right? Because there are ways in which you could delve out an argument, which might be very good for an academic paper, but for a seven-minute debate speech, you're going way too much into detail. But finding what the exact like pinpoint moment of it is is, is really hard. Um, I think one of the benefits of taking like the simple version of PCM that we talked about is actually isn't that much management yet, because you're basically looking at what are things I find important, and like what do, what do actually stakeholders find important. Um, and if you have those things, that, that really helps. And then if you have this meeting where you say, like, what do we need to do? Uh, and when do we do it? And how do we do it? Those, I think, are very simple questions. And if you don't try to model yourself into that, I think that would be very, very useful. Um, but I know that this is going to be very difficult. One of the first tournaments I ran, I had an almost minute-to-minute schedule uh, because I was very afraid that we were going to run late. Uh, and then uh, one of my co-conveners said to me, like, if you tell a volunteer that they need to do this thing at 4.03 p.m. exactly, they're going to get scared of you. Uh, and you want to therefore also make sure that that type of human element is there as well. Um, so I would say just run it as much as possible and just have like more frequent check-ins. Uh, I think the IT sector has done a lot of work on that. That's why they, called, they, they have a far more lean programming uh, sector. So if you want to look at a sector that does really well on, on building a project without getting too much management, um, look at these guys. Uh, like That does mean I am saying look at Agile Scrum, which I think also has a bit of a uh, bit of a joke approach in, in the wider management community as being full of buzzwords. But if you look through the buzzwords, um, it is, I think, very helpful to have just a, these quick meetings where you, you're checking with everyone. Certainly when you're in implementation, uh, quickly checking with everyone, see where they are. It's probably going to be enough management for you. 
Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds like quite useful tips on the trade off. Um, yeah, so so maybe just getting to the whole project management experience. So knowing about this framework, but also reflecting on your wealth of experience organizing events. What are maybe without the framework, but maybe even with it, what do you seem to be like the most common mistakes that people do, um, or the biggest ones that you know are maybe sometimes avoidable? if people just thought, thought a bit more hard? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think that there is a perfectionist drive that definitely exists in a lot of debate organizers, because I think it exists in the community as a whole, that you want to get everything perfect. Um, and that could be a problem because nothing will get perfect and it really stresses you out, but it also means that you might feel like, where do I start in organizing all of these things? So I think that might be one of the first issues to run into. Um, I think secondly, people might find it um, that like they want to run too much things in advance and, and want to think about too much problems that they have. I have a feeling that most of the events that we run as a debate community, um, you can adjust on the go. Uh, certainly if it's volunteer run and people will generally be lenient to you. So don't worry too much. And certainly for smaller events, test them out, but do test something out in advance. Like I think many, like there's very few events that run a dry run of things that, that test out some things in advance. And I think that is really useful. Um, so for instance, one of the things that bigger events like World and Euros do is they test out their running system. They test out a tap round in advance. And it's really helpful for like finding out where the chokeholds are. Um, I've run tournaments where the first time that we probably got to meet the high school in which we hosted it was on the day itself. Uh, and then you don't really know where like good sight lines are or walking lines are. Um, and that can become really problematic. So I would suggest that you do a little bit of preparatory work in advance. Uh, and if you can test out a couple of things in advance, that will be really useful. Yeah. I've had a similar experience. The way we solved it was by being there at 5 a.m. So there's, <laughs> there's an approach. Um, <laughs> great. Um, so maybe moving on to the questions that we actually got before, mm -hmm. The recording from our members um, yeah so I think the first question was which is also related to um, project management was how do you organize events during lockdown um, great so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that and then I can jump in with my experience because I've actually done knows this but I've actually been working on an over overview document or like lessons document from I have been interviewing men, like people from across the idea network about their response to Corona and how they handled it, what they found successful, what they found problematic. So I actually have some thoughts on what our members um, have found useful and important when organizing events during lockdown. But yeah, before that, do you have any <laughs> thoughts, Dan? I have some thoughts, although I'm very interested to hear about you. Like I got to zone in one of your meetings and I think that uh, we're going to learn a lot about the members and when your project comes out. Um, so obviously it means that we've had to move from physical to digital meetings. And it actually meant that we had to learn a new set of skills. Uh, whilst at the same time, everyone around us was learning a new set of skills as well. Uh, I feel that one of the things that we probably uh, want to do during these kind of moments of, of appraisal is to say we can tone down the complexity of some of the events. Like hosting a full training session on an evening with like two rounds and feedback probably is going to be very difficult. If you run one debate training session, that probably is enough. Uh, and I think the second thing that you want to look at is that this means that with digital work is going to require a lot of new skills. Like we've all learned a lot about how Zoom works, how to set up all these kind of calls. Uh, and we're still learning uh, and, and trying to approach that. So I think that that is very useful to uh, check in on as well uh, because we get it, get this thing wrong very frequently. And um making sure that you, you, you work on that in advance and like prepare a technical document for preparation probably is very useful. And I think the final thing that I would say is that it is going to be a lot more hard to attract new people. So I think you want to really uh, make sure that you keep the ties to the ones that are already into the community um, because this might take a while uh, and those people are likely going to be your volunteers for tomorrow. So making sure that they keep feeling engaged and their needs are met are I think the most important thing you want to focus on right now. Uh, and that if there is something that you could do at the expense of uh, attracting more people, I think that this 
at this stage is the right choice to make. But I'm, I'm very curious what you've learned. Yeah, so <laughs> here comes the Intel briefing. Great, so uh, yeah, so to answer the reader's question that we got, um, it's true, like just organizing events during lockdown is very hard. Um, and member, like organizations from across our net network have experienced a lot of drop down for many reasons. One of them being, well, for big reason, just being disruption to school, to like, students' education, which means they had a lot more material to catch up on and have also just been often like generally overwhelmed with online classes. Uh, I can, you know, there's a lot of writing on the internet about Zoom fatigue. I can, you know, I'm not going to school online, but I can't even imagine like doing that all day long and then jumping on a debate. So uh, I think it's quite understandable. But we also have like found a few pieces of advice on what is important and how can people be better at organizing online events and the biggest thing that has consistently come up is just being really clear on technical instructions and making sure there aren't any mishaps so i think it's especially important when it comes to tournaments where you know if someone drops out mid speech it is very important to have a protocol for that and also it's very important to guide people very clearly through the setup process which might be different for your debate event that it has been for other things it's done in the past um, great. So, so that's been one, one big thing. Another finding that we've had is generally once people have tried online debating and tried engaging in online events, they generally kept coming back. So it seems to be the case that probably somewhat related to the technical hurdles, uh, once people overcome them, it actually tends to be the case that people quite like online debating and online events. Um, so I guess the advice coming out from that is for your membership base, it's kind of just important to promote, 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 and do a harder push than you would be used to for regular events to which people are already used to going. Um, and I guess the third bit of advice was on community so that consistently, I mean, probably everyone because of the physical distancing, people have found uh, the community aspect of events, but also general life often quite lacking. Um, so it has been useful to hear about ways that people try to supplement it with various degrees of success. So of course it can be, it's never going to be as good as being somewhere in person, but uh, we've heard organizations having great experiences. So for example, in Albania, the lockdown has been very harsh um, and they also, but they managed to organize like a very successful Zoom online social events for, for all their members that I think people really appreciate it. And for tournaments, um, the best idea that I've heard, the best advice has been to just try to make sure to have Zoom rooms during a tournament also open for just chit chat, um, ideally with moderation, just because, um, yeah, it's people are at home alone during the debate tournament. So, you know, while they're having lunch, they'll probably would love to just chat with their debate buddies. Um, yeah, so I think that would be on the advice on organizing debates during lockdown, but I guess just to add on um, the lessons from Corona, I think there also have been like a number of upsides. One of them has definitely been the extent to which like online activities take down geographical barriers. Um, so it has been a lot easier for people from around the world really, but really our, ne our network to engage with international teams to get really good judges that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get to their debates, to get former alumni who now live abroad to like engage more strongly with the organization and do more coaching. So that I, seems to have been a big upside, which is why a lot of people are saying that even after this pandemic, hopefully it will you know, fizzle out sooner rather than later, uh, many people are saying they want to keep aspects of the online events. So in a way, there's there've also been, there've also been benefits and, Another, I guess the last benefit that I've heard about is the extent to which the Zoom format, as opposed to in-person format, emphasizes the extent to which debate is a conversational and uh, cooperative and truth-seeking endeavor rather than a performative uh, experience where someone gets on the stage, like does something for a few minutes, and that sits down. Um, yeah, so I guess that would be my very extended answer to the question of how people can um, organize events during lockdowns. And I guess we've had two more mm -hmm. reader questions. 
um, that uh, Dan can address, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I just want to echo how wonderful I feel that what you tell me is that debate does have the opportunity to be more inclusive on a digital setting. Uh, that, that really does feel inspiring. And I've noticed it as well when I organized, uh, not organized, but participated this time in uh, tournaments as a judge, is that there was like a competition or hosted by the people from Germany, but we had teams from India coming over. Um, and that usually would have been like 400, 500 euros in flights easily. And now that you could just sit in from their dorms. Uh, and I just think that that is a fantastic opportunity that we really should open to all. Uh, because the debate about financial inclusion in uh, debating has been going on for a very long time. But certainly teams from the developing world are very often lacking out on the resources they need to participate. And I think we should still strive to get them the resources they need to also come to the physical world. Because there are these community building aspects. There is the extra type of feedback. The fact you can run into a judge in the corner that is so important that we want to keep access to it. But at the very least, also making sure that they get access to the uh, established networks and established quality trainings that exists uh, in, in larger, more well-funded debate clubs, I think is a very, very good benefit. I'm very happy to hear also that our members are wanting to keep introducing uh, debate online as well. The uh, other set of questions had to do with debate promotion. Um, and I think that I, I, I'm going to probably tackle them both at the same time. Um, and one of them was surrounding how do I just in general promote my tournament or other event to new audiences. Uh, and the second one was explicitly if I'm running like an international event, how do I get teams from abroad to come in? And I think both have similar answers, but I'm going to go a little bit more into detail in the second one. One of the things I think that makes debating a little bit of daunting to get into for some people is that a lot of the debate network is a relatively informal set of social media groups that you want to get into. Uh, so the big benefit that I think of like watching this video if you're like new to debating and debate organizing or if you don't have a large amount of an established network is that we tell you that it is on social media. Um, debating has tended to still be on Facebook even though the uh, now young generation of debaters has moved more and more on Instagram and other uh, types of like more fleeting social media aspects. But a lot of the organizing community uh, communication is still done on Facebook. So make sure that you enter a couple of these Facebook groups. Uh, nearly every uh, regional and European circuit, for instance, has uh, um, a, their own Facebook group. There's one for like the Netherlands, for Germany, there's one for Europe as a whole. Um, and they'll also advertise, uh, the club will also advertise on Instagram as well. So make sure that you build up a list of uh, social media groups uh, and debate clubs that you can follow um, because you can both plug your tournament there as well as find out where other tournaments are happening. And I think that is probably going to be uh, helpful for the first generation to sit in. Make also sure, therefore, that if there is like younger generations, that you have such a list, that you keep such a list in, within the community so they know where to find you. If you have an umbrella organization in your country, like SDA in Slovakia, where Moimir is, I'm sure they also have that type of information. So feel free to knock on their door uh, and they'll probably help you get set up. And then promote your tournaments using the social media channels, because uh, that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, having your own website for these is nice to have, but I feel not urgent anymore. I think most people engage most of the time on social media in the 2.0 internet, um, and the extra website is a good repository for information, uh, but only if you have information that you don't think you can have in the event page as a whole, do you need such a website in the first place. And then specifically for attracting uh, foreign teams. So I think that for foreign teams, the as the obstacle is that, of course, the threshold for traveling to your country can be a bit higher. Maybe not for every organization. Like I know that the, the, the debates that happen in Paris, for instance, are always oversubscribed because everyone just wants to go to Paris. But maybe not everyone wants to go to Gdansk because they haven't heard of it. Uh, and if you haven't, Gdansk is great and you should totally go there. Uh, what helps is, uh, first of all, that you announce very much on time. Uh, because things like flights and train tickets get more expensive closer to the date. So if people are planning their travel, you want to know very much in advance. It's certainly the case for if you run a school's tournament, because the kids also need, very often will need to get some days off from school, uh, and you really want to make sure that there's the room and time to ask for that in advance. Um, the second thing you can think of is the fact that if there are financial hurdles, um, is you may want to think about maybe some of them can't pay for it, uh, and then you want to uh, introduce adjusted registration fees. 
Um, you might even compensate the other direction. Uh, I know that the Oxford or Cambridge universities often asks for more for foreign teams because the foreign teams tended to historically be from American colleges who uh, are very well funded and could afford it. Uh, as you know, having gone to Yale uh, and, and, and seen the endowment that has taken place there. But in general, that might be another thing that helps. But I don't think money is the end or be all uh, that attracts teams to come to your organization. It helps if they know that your tournament is to be trusted. And one of the things that help with that is to get a couple of internationally known t people on your team uh, to run as your tap master or run as your chief adjudication team. Um, what's also very helpful is that they themselves very often are able to bring in people as well. And what I would suggest here is that you have a mix of more experienced and newer international team members. The more experienced ones, they offer like a great benefit in terms of like everyone know who the upcoming CA of the World Championships is. Um, so they're thinking, ah, this room will be a safe pair of hands and, and we definitely want to go. But these people tend to be in so many teams that they don't really have a lot of personal favors to call in. Whereas if you bring an up and coming person from a circuit, they'd be much more likely to be able to get some friends enthusiastic and say, you, you should definitely join us. Um, and a lot of friends would want to support them for what could be one of their first CA gigs. So if you have that kind of mix, uh, I think that would be very helpful for uh, adjusting for teams from abroad. I think finally, what you want to look at is, are there any other requirements that need to be taken into account? Like for instance, are the visa requirements? Uh, and if there are, you want to ahead of time, make sure that you have the documentation ready uh, for the visa. Um, what I found, for instance, when I did the visas for Dutch Worlds, is that um, embassies can be quite bureaucratic and very discriminatory. Certainly the embassies of the developed world in the developing world. And one of the things that really smoothed over the process is if you had someone who you who could call from the country in which the event was organized. Like if I from the Netherlands called into the embassy, um, that really made our uh, uh, tournament look a lot better. And in fact, uh, we had lots of difficulties getting kids from Bangladesh in that year. And that was predominantly, I feel, because the embassy, there was no Dutch embassy that did the consular services there. So we had to call the Swedish embassies. Uh, and my Swedish is very poor, so I couldn't really get through to them uh, as well as I could get through to one of the other ones. Uh, and it also really helps smoothing up the process uh, when people arrive. Like there were a couple of people who didn't ask for a visa in advance, but needed one coming from South Africa. Uh, and when they landed on Schiphol, they were detained by the uh, border police who then called me on the first day of Christmas asking if they really were coming to our event. Uh, they were, and they, they got in as a consequence. Uh, but having that sort of thing figured out in advance is very helpful, certainly if you uh, are running an event where you want to, outside of the Schengen area, and you want to get people in uh, who don't necessarily um, get in for free. Yeah, that's really useful. I'll actually, I actually have a few, few thoughts to add okay. on yeah, to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what you just said about promoting events abroad. And the first one is with regards to the lockdown and travel restrictions, which is just, it is naturally, you know, in a way it's easier to get people who are really far away, but in a way it's also harder just because the competition has increased because people don't have to travel anywhere and there's so many online debate tournaments. Uh, so I think the advice that Dan just gave is like all the more important is, uh, getting known people uh, in the organization, but also reaching out through our connections. Uh, so I think a lot of this, a lot of promotion happens by word of mouth and organizers and tournaments build up their reputations. Um, so that is probably, it's probably a longer project than just one tournament. So speaking from experience of SDA, it every year organizes BSDC, which is Bird's Law School Debating Competition. And I think the way it has really built itself up and now it's like, Lots of international teams, lots of, well, a fair number of world schools teams come every year. And the way it has built itself up, Singapore, I think, comes almost every year. The way it has built itself up is just uh, doing a pretty good job every year, um, having fair fees, um, and really making a reputation on the circuit about being a well-organized tournament. So, yeah, that would be just the thing I wanted to add. It's probably more of a uh, journey than um, just organizing one tournament 
um, if one actually wants to maximize the number of foreign teams that they count. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, addition, Mavir. I think that's very helpful. Uh, and I think that these were all the questions that we've had. Um, so we're going to round up this session. We want to host a session every two weeks. Um, so please tune in us with us in with us uh, in two weeks again on Thursday. We're also working on a, a separate project that might be entering into these type of live sessions and podcast feeds. Uh, so keep your eyes and ears open for that one as well. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any feedback or any questions you want to ask, please uh, leave a reply or mail us at podcast at idebate.nl. That's podcast at idebate.nl. And we'll get back to you. That includes if you want to know more about the work we do at IDEA, if you have tips for next sessions, if you want to be featured maybe even, um, feel very free uh, to mail us uh, about anything that your hearts desire. Um, that's us signing off for now. Have a great day. And thank you for listening to IDI. Thank you very much.